We're so glad that you're with us this morning. If you have your Bibles, I want you to take them and turn to the book of Esther in the Old Testament again, if you would. The book of Esther uh, in the Old Testament, as we walk through uh, the book of Esther together, what a great, great book for a time like this. It's really amazing how much the culture of that time and uh, those people reflect so much the culture of today. Today, I want to talk to you about the pain of prejudice. We're going to talk about prejudice, racism. We're going to talk about what it means to have hatred for other people to the point where we absolutely exclude them or want to even eradicate them from the face of the earth, which is a historical fact over the centuries that has taken place. The pain of prejudice. That's Esther chapter 3, if you would, beginning in verse 6. And as you, uh, as you look at this, before I have you stand, let me just say this to you. I'm so glad to be a part of First Baptist Church of Ulysses. And let me just say why First Ulysses is so unique. It's unique because it has a great, great history of standing on the Bible and letting the truth of the Scripture inform what we believe. It has a way, uh, this church has, of letting the convictions that we learn, that we gain through the Word of God turn into the conduct that we have, our beliefs turn into our behaviors, and that's such a big deal. Because in a world where the culture seems to be sweeping people away in their thoughts and their actions, people that are rooted in the Word of God can stand firm. It's the only rock, by the way, to stand on. And I'm thankful that our church is like that. It's important for us to remember that we live in a culture. Amen. It's important for us to remember that we live in a culture around us that's rapidly changing. Who could have imagined 20 years ago some of the things that we now see on a regular basis as things that people believe, things that people do, things that people claim as rights today. It's just amazing that the last two decades have been unprecedented in the amount of change. That's why it's so important for us to know really what is true, and what's right, what, what is just, what, what, what should we do in a changing culture. At the same time, our community around us is changing as well. Did you know that Trinity High School, right across the street from our church, is the number one high school in the state of Texas for diversity. There are more people from more backgrounds in that school than any other school in the state of Texas. And did you know that it was number four in the nation? So only three schools in the United States of America have a more diverse makeup of their students. That gives us unprecedented opportunity, but it also wants to, uh, means that we must be very aware of all that they see and feel uh, here in this community. So we want to be aware of that. We also want to be aware of how to think, how to love, how to reach out to them. The book of Esther provides a, a phenomenal backdrop for us to learn the mistakes of that pagan culture and to pick up what God's culture calls us to. So let's stand together as we read Esther chapter 3. We'll read a number of verses beginning in verse 6 to the end of the chapter. A long text, but important for us to get through the truths that we're going to be looking at. If you remember, Haman has been promoted. Mordecai refuses to bow to him. So Haman is filled with pride and rage, and he lashes out against Mordecai, a righteous man, a God follower, who is the adopted father of Esther, who has now become the queen. But this Haman takes his hatred of Mordecai to an unprecedented level. Beginning in verse 6, here's what it says. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had told him who the people of Mordecai were. Therefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. Now, as I get into this, let me ask you to stop a moment and let this sink through. This hatred extended not only to one man, but to a whole race of people. And he was saying, let's exterminate this group of people. In the first month, which is the month in the sign, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, Pur, that is, the lot, was cast before Haman from day to day and from month to month until the twelfth month, that is, the month Adar. And Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the peoples of all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of all other people, and they do not observe the king's laws. So it is not in the king's interest to let them remain. If it's pleasing to the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed. And I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who carry on the king's business to put into the king's treasury. So verse 10 is a response from the king. The king took the sixth ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, 
the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. The king said to Haman, the silver is yours and the people also to do with him as you please. Then the king's scribes were summoned on the 13th day of the first month, and it was written just as Haman commanded to the king's satraps, to the governors who were over all the provinces, and to the princes of each people, each province according to its script, each people according to its language, being written in the name of King Ahasuerus and sealed with the king's signet ring. That makes all this official. So verse 13. Letters were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces to destroy to kill and to annihilate all the Jews, both young and old, women and children, in one day, the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month Adar, which was to seize their possession as plunder. A copy of the edict to be issued as law in every province was published to all the people so that they would be ready for this day. The couriers went out, impelled by the king's command, while the decree was issued at the citadel of Susa, and while the king and Haman sat down to drink the city of Susa, was in confusion. Father, in Jesus' name, help us. As we walk through this long and detailed text that reveals much about the heart of man, Father, I pray that you'll let it speak to us here and now in the culture in which we live and that we might be shining lights in a dark area of our culture. I ask this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, <coughs> excuse me, Please be seated if you would. <clears throat> so let the magnitude of that text sink in. The king says, on one day, I'm going to deputize every resident of these 127 provinces and I want you to wipe the Jews off the face of the earth. I want you to kill them. And I want you to take everything that's theirs as plunder for your own possessions. Now, as you let that sink in for just a moment, I want you to realize that that's not the only time in history that that's happened. That's happened a number of times. And as we began to dig into the, into the details of what was going on in this man Haman's life and, and how did it move from hatred from one man to the hatred of a whole race, and what are we to do about that in this day and time when that same kind of spirit still operates? How do we handle those issues? I think I want you to note today, and we'll go through very rapidly this morning, a number of truths that are important to observe. First of all, I want you to see that the overall theme of the book of Esther is about God's redemption of a people, and God will accomplish redemption one way or another. It's a very encouraging overall message that God will save his people, and he will redeem his people. No matter how many wicked people are coming against God's people, God's people will survive, and God's people will thrive because... God. But how does this kind of hatred unroll? How does it unravel? What does it do? Some things I want you to note about the cause of prejudice in Haman's life. Haman's pride, and we looked at that last week, produced hatred and fear. And it led to the condemning of the entire Jewish race. It was a personal vendetta against Mordecai for not bending the knee. Then it was a spiritual vendetta in that it, it moved into every fiber of his heart and then it became literally satanic in that, that, that Satan is always at work trying to destroy God's people, but it began just with this pride and then this fear. And it was a hatred for God's people. Today we call that anti-Semitism. We call that a hatred against the Jewish people, Jew hatred is the actual Hebrew word given to that over the centuries. And you see it cropping up from time to time throughout history. In fact, if you go back to the history of, of Germany and in, in the World War II era, you'll see the Nazi hatred for Jews was almost unprecedented. Six million Jews died over a very short period of time, something we should never forget, that hatred and pride are always posed against good people and even God's people. But what happened then happened because of the same thing that was going on in Haman's life. I want us to learn some lessons, some lessons that are warning signs that we avoid, that you avoid, that I avoid, that all of us avoid. Three of them. Number one, hatred gives birth to prejudice and racism. Hatred gives birth to prejudice and racism. 
The Bible says in verse six that he actually disdained to lay hands on Mordecai. Even though Mordecai was the man that wouldn't bend the knee, Mordecai was the man that would not do what Haman wanted, but, but he, he wanted not only to take it out on Mordecai, but all of the people of Mordecai scattered over 127 provinces. What began with hatred began to spread in a radical national way because Haman had enough political clout to get it done but it began with hatred. I want you to also notice that hatred uses words to malign and to generalize. Digging into the text in verse eight, you'll see how he words his decree to the king. He said, there's a certain people scattered and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of all the other people. They don't observe the king's laws. It is not in the king's interest to let them remain. Notice he never names them by name. Notice he generalizes, he categorizes, he places them in the position of enemies in the kingdom in which they were really not enemies. A commentator named Brenneman said this, Haman used a mixture of truth, error, and exaggeration to convince the king. His accusation of the Jews was diabolically clever in its construction, proceeding as it did from the truth to a half-truth to an outright lie, leading them to believe that the Jews were an enemy. Now, let me just say this at this moment. This is a tactic used throughout all of history, that words and language will begin to categorize and at some point make a group of people less than human, less than valuable in anyone's eyes. I was at a remarkable event last night where we um, celebrated Mid-Cities Pregnancy Center and when we also looked at the problem of abortion in our nation. And in that banquet, our speaker called attention to the fact that the way you begin to lose value for an unborn child is to begin to think of them and talk of them as something less than human. Now, if you think about over the era of abortion in America, that's exactly what's taken place. We have called that baby in the womb a mass of tissue or an unformed fetus, when in reality, from conception onward, that is a human being in every sense of the word. And only in recent years where the sonogram has become a tool for young women who are with child to be able to see their child, have they begun to believe that's a real human being because it's shaped like a human being, it moves like a human being, it looks like a human being. But the tactic used from the past is it's subhuman. That's exactly what this man was saying about the Jewish people. It's also exactly what happens today with racism where we categorize someone, where we put them in a category and somehow cause them to be seen as someone less than valuable or less than human. You know what the Bible says about our words, right? The Bible says about our words that they proceed from the heart. And when there is hatred in the heart, the words that come out are words that are fueled by hatred, not love, fueled by hatred and not truth. Probably one of the most startling examples that I've experienced here as a pastor uh, was experience with a man who got very angry one day. He actually was a a man, an older man that um, was a member of his church at the time. And uh, he was very angry. He had a problem with people of other color, anybody of other color, because of where he was raised. And I didn't know all the background, but I remember one time we had a guest artist here. They led worship, they they led in singing, and they were African-American. And they did a phenomenal job. And this man got so angry that he stormed out of church with his family. And uh, on the way out, he took his Bible and he threw it into the stream just outside here. So angry. One of our staff members observed that and they went and got the Bible out. And there in the first page was his name, address, and phone number. (laughs) So I made a call that week. I asked him to come talk to me. And when I asked him to tell me about what was going on, about why would anybody, I'd never heard of that, throw their Bible into the water because of something they didn't like in the service, he began to tell me a story of having been raised over 60 years before and having come to believe that people of color had not the same value, that literally they did not have souls. More than 60 years before, he'd been taught from a boyhood up that only white people had value. Only white people had souls. 
I'm happy to tell you as we opened the Bible up and began to talk about what God really said, that that man broke under the power of the conviction of the Holy Spirit, repented of his sin, and said, I never knew, I never knew that we all had value in God's eyes. And he walked out set free. My point in sharing this with you today is that that exists. There are people that actually believe that, that not all people are created equal. And because of words that have been placed in his mind as a young boy, he grew up a racist and not realizing why or how. And because it's real, you and I who walk by the truth have to be able to call it out, be able to know what's happening when we hear it and we see it. We see it in Haman's life. The third thing we see in Haman's life was that hatred brings division and confusion. It doesn't take much for us to see what it says in verse 10. The Bible says, as they came to the place of rusting after the command was given. And you see it all the way down, especially in verse 15, that all kinds of division and confusion took place. While the king and Haman drank, the people were confused. In their minds, the Jewish people were not a threat. They were not an enemy. But because of Haman's action, they all began to be confused. They began to see what the edict said, and they began to wonder, how are we to be involved in that? Bottom line, real people are impacted by the hatred of just a few. This past week, we were in, in a study session for this text. And Ed Coe is one of our pastors. He's pastors in the International Church, and and uh, he's preaching right now the same text. And he told me, he said to the group of people in the room, he said, I was raised in China, I'm Chinese. He said, but my parents moved to Indonesia when, when I was young. And he said, all the time growing up in Indonesia, I was the object of scorn because I was not an Indonesian. I was different from them in some way. He said, so I grew up the object of jokes, the subject of racism. I was left out of everything. And he said, consequently, I grew up resenting the Indonesian people. I experienced racism until I grew up. I always had a hatred for those in Indonesia because of the way they treated me as subhuman, as inferior. He said, only when I came to Christ did I recognize what was going on. And only when I came to Christ was I set free from my hatred of Indonesian people. And he said, now every year I go to Indonesia and I preach mission trips and preach conferences and crusades for people in Indonesia to come to Christ. God freed me from that. But my point is that Ed experienced that. In every human culture, that potential exists and it exists here. Last week I asked some of our people to go out and ask the question of African Americans in our region here, have you ever experienced racism? Here's what they told me. Um, my experience was when I was walking down the street with my husband, and we were just holding hand in hand, and a white cop pulls up, and he looks at us and says, why are y'all in this neighborhood? I was like, you know, I live just on Main Street at the end. He's like, well, I need to see some license and registration. I'm like, so you're asking me, or are you asking both of us? I'm asking you, because it doesn't look like you're supposed to be here. And I was a cop for 41 years and four months. That's 15,085 days. And I was proud to wear the uniform over in Dallas. And I was getting on the elevator one day and I had my full uniform on going to check on something. And the lady in the elevator decided that she needed to grab her purse a little tight and she clutched it to her bosom. And I asked her, was anything wrong? And she said, uh, no. I said, well, why are you clutching your purse like that? She said, because you're a black man, you might rob me. I said, but I'm in a uniform. Don't you see I'm the police? She said, that doesn't matter. I don't think you can be black in America without experiencing racism. Um, I know for my three young men growing up in suburban Dallas, all of them had um, uh, episodes in high school and things like that. One of them, he was... Um, exercising, practicing with his cross-country team, and a car follows his cross-country team, screaming at him, run, run. At work, every day. I take phone calls every day, and just from the sound of my voice, people know that I'm a black woman. And, you know, sometimes they, they give me an issue with that, you know. 
older white people. It's where I experience it most. It's real. It impacts people's lives. These are simple stories of people that didn't seek us out. We just sought them out. We just asked a simple question. I preached this message in the first service, had several people come up to me and said to me, this is my experience. This is what happened to me. And, and what I want you to know today, if you have been the object of racism, if you have been uh, on the other end, the receiving end of racism, I want to say to you, I am so sorry that you've experienced that at the hands of people that don't know your value, that don't love you, that, that don't know God's plan in your life and how incredibly loving he is to you. And I'm not here today to explain that away. And I'm not here today to give someone an excuse for that. I'm here today to say, it's a problem, and what do the people of God do about it? That's what I'm here to say. I'm here to say it in Haman's life, it was an expression he had that affected many, many people. And I'm here to ask the question, what does God say to his people about all this? I ask you to take your Bible and turn to the book of Micah in the, in the, in the Old Testament for just a moment. The book of Micah has one verse that I want to look at because it is a prescription for what I call the antidote of prejudice, the antidote of prejudice. Now we're gonna look more at Esther in the weeks ahead at how God solved the problem there. God solved the problem there in a much more simple way by removing Haman altogether. Haman hung on his own gallows for the things that he was doing and the things that he was stirring. But God gives a command to his people in the book of Micah chapter six beginning in verse eight. A book written to the people of Judah who were very affluent, very wealthy, and yet allowed injustices to occur in their culture. And he said to the leaders and the teachers, here's what I want you to do about these injustices. Verse 8, a famous verse, we hear it all the time. Here's the application of it. He has told you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? And here's a phrase here we need to remember. But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Bottom line, God says, I want these, th these things to come out of your life, those of you who follow me, to reflect me, to reflect my character. And those three things are what I would call an antidote to prejudice. Here's what they are one by one. Number one, seek justice. The word do justice is what we find in the New American Standard. The first prescription that God gives is that justice needs to be done. Justice is blind. Justice takes place because of a sense of right and wrong, no matter who is on the other side of that, uh, that behavior or those circumstances. Maybe you remember the Statue of Liberty in, in the New York Harbor in New York. You remember the Statue of Liberty has a blindfold. She holds up scales. And the idea behind that is that there is no preference when it comes to justice. There is no partiality when it comes to justice. All should be treated fairly in every way. One of the ideals of America, and certainly God's character is that of justice. We are to seek justice. But let me tell you, as the people of God today, we have to lead the way in seeking justice. We can't let someone else do that. We have to speak up about all kinds of issues that are unjust. We have to speak out against abortion. We have to speak out against abuse. We have to speak out against racism because it is unjust and it has victims as a result of that. So first of all, we seek justice. We use the privilege we have. We use the influence we have in order to speak justice into every circumstance that we see that needs to be corrected. One of my favorite preachers is a guy by the name of Brian Loritz. Brian preached at our church several times when I pastored in Chattanooga, Tennessee. He's an African-American pastor in Atlanta, Georgia. Lately, he came out with a phrase that was a very unusual phrase attached to the phrase, white privilege. And he had probably more insight than I've seen anyone else have about this. Here's what he said, and I agree with it. He said the phrase white privilege is problematic. The, if privilege was inherently evil, then Jesus was evil. I never thought about that before. Jesus had all privilege. No one was born with more privilege than he. But we have a measure of privilege, all of us do. The issue is not the privilege we have, but it's stewardship. What will we do with the privilege we have? Jesus had all privilege, and yet he gave his life as a ransom for many. We have incredible opportunities, incredible privilege. And what will we do with that? Will we seek justice? Will we demonstrate mercy? Brian Loritz was right. 
whatever opportunity, whatever influence you have, seek justice. Secondly, the Word of God tells us to love mercy, or in this phrase, in the New American Standard, love kindness. Now, let me just say this to you today, and I think all of you will agree with me 100% today about this. I love mercy. I love mercy. And I love mercy because I need mercy. Anybody in this room love mercy? Would you raise your hand if you love mercy? I'm not going to be timid about that question. Every single one of us need forgiveness. Every single one of us need mercy. Every single one of us that have come to Jesus Christ have received all of the mercy of God. So the people of God who have received the mercy of God ought to be the very best ones at extending mercy to others. In the same way you've been loved. In the same way that you've been shown kindness. Show kindness. So God says, I want my character on display in your life as my people. I want you to do justice. I want you to show mercy and love mercy and kindness. And that's what the gospel is all about. The gospel is that demonstration of God's mercy to us. And then lastly, embrace humility or walk humbly. What I call Pride and solo awareness is far too prevalent. What is solo awareness? Solo awareness is we're aware only of our own lives. That we don't see a problem if we've never experienced it before. Now, the reason we don't see it as a problem because we've never experienced it before is because we're not aware of other people that have gone through all kinds of issues in their life, all kinds of taunts, all kinds of somehow being discriminated. So what we have to do is be humble and say, I don't know everything there is. It means that I have to say, I have much to learn. I need to listen. I need to learn from those that have experienced racism. And until I acknowledge that my experience is not uh, everybody's experience, that there will be no reconciliation at all, and I walk in ignorance. Many of you remember Richard Taylor. Richard is a great preacher who's been here a number of times. He's an African-American preacher. We walked, worked together with evangelism strategies. We worked together in, in different ways. I had lunch with him not too long ago. And in that lunch, I asked Richard, can you tell me the ways that you personally have been discriminated here in this area over the last few years? And he did not hesitate. He began to name them one by one. And I was astounded at the long list that he put together. Now, Richard, again, is not a guy that would have volunteered that had I not asked. He said, it's just part of what I deal with, part of what I live under. But if you want to know, here is what it is. And I determined in my heart that I would listen better, that I would find out what those problems are, that I would do everything that I could to influence others who are Christ followers to be able to live above the fray of a culture that segregates, a culture that hurts others, a culture that sometimes races in what we do. We have to live above the fray. We have to be different if we're God's people. It comes with the calling. It comes by letting the Holy Spirit of God come into our lives. But all of our influence that we have is based on the truth that God gives us. And today I put together 10 statements that I want you to hear and that I want you to say because the truth sets us free and the truth that I'm going to share with you are the 10 truths of the Bible as it pertains to people. So let me just give you those one by one. First of all, all are made in God's image. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, that God made us, and when he made us, he made us in the image of God. Every human being is made in the image of God. All are made in God's image. Would you say that with me? It's on the screen. All are made with God's image. Say it again. All are made with God's image. The Bible also tells us that all of us are sinners corrupted by original sin. If I go to Romans chapter 3, it says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's why we have problems. That's why we don't measure up. That's why people are left out. That's why racism exists. Would you make that statement with me? All are sinners corrupted by original sin. The third statement has to do with who we are in Christ. Galatians chapter 3, verse 20 tells us that there is neither slave nor free man, male nor female, Jew nor Gentile, but we're all one in Jesus Christ. And that includes every race of every person on the planet who's come to faith in Jesus. So affirm that with me. Say it with me. All as believers are one in Christ. These are things we believe. 
In Acts chapter two, Pentecost took place with a group of people that were from a diverse set of backgrounds. And the Bible says they were all brought together by the power of the Holy Spirit. That literally the gospel brings us together in Christ and literally the Holy Spirit made them one in that day and time. And so that's the truth. All are brought together by the Holy Spirit. Would you affirm that with me? All are brought together by the Holy Spirit. James chapter two, the Bible talks about partiality. The Bible says that we should not favor one or the other. And so I want you to affirm this truth with me as well. All are called to impartiality. Let's say it together. All are called to impartiality. Matthew chapter 22 is our great command. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And the second command is likened to it, that you should love your neighbor as yourself. Therefore, all are called, all of us are called to love one another. Say that with me. All are called to love one another one another. First John chapter three, verse 15, another statement. It says, if we hate our brother, the love of God is not in us. And so we're called to reject hate, all of us, in every situation. Affirm that with me, would you? All are called to reject hate. The Bible also says in first Corinthians 13, that we are to bear all things and to endure all things and to look for the good in every person. That's the love chapter in the Bible. It's not just a marriage chapter, it's a way that unconditional love is expressed to the lives of believers. The truth, all are to look for the best in others. Say that with me. All are to look for the best in others. Number nine, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter two that Christ has pulled down the dividing wall between Jew and Gentile, between every race because of the cross, and thereby we can fellowship with one another. So here's the truth, say it with me. All are called to fellowship together. And then lastly, number 10, the Bible tells us in the book of Revelation that when Christ comes back and we're brought to be with him in heaven, that we will fellowship with every tribe, every nation, every background, every tongue and language group. We'll all be together as believers in heaven forever and ever and ever. And that gives rise to this final truth. Are you ready to say it with me? All who are in Christ will reign together in heaven. And folks, those are the truths that we walk by. 10 truths that should guide us, 10 truths that should give us conviction based on biblical truth that we follow because of the call of Christ in our lives. Now, here's what I'm convinced of. I'm convinced of the fact that racism will not be eradicated until sin is eradicated. And that'll still keep on because of sin until Jesus comes back. But I also believe that God can redeem and change a racist and a hater one life at a time through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you believe that today? I also believe that when we as the body of Christ begin to live in that kind of love, we can impact our culture as the church, as the body of Christ, as the bride of Christ, living out the character of Jesus. And that's what we're called to do. Of all places that people of all races should find safety, it would be the house of the living God. Of all places that people should find love and be encouraged and be, and be looked at with the best intentions, it should be the church of Jesus Christ. And I'm thankful our church has that going for us, that we love people, that we love God, and we want to embrace them and help them move forward in life. And we have an amazing opportunity in the days ahead to do that. But the redemption that this book is all about and the redemption that the Bible is all about that brings us all together first brings us all together with Christ as individuals. Let me say this to you today. Let me say that this message ought to do one of two things for you. First of all, it ought to bring you to the place of realizing that you cannot love unconditionally until you've been loved unconditionally. And and it could cause you to want to learn the love of Christ in your life. And let me say to you this morning that the opportunity for you to come to Christ today is is present, it's real, it's now. And in just a few moments, I'm going to urge you to come and talk to someone about making Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life. He died on the cross to pay for our sins. He purchased uh, for us a place in heaven. He's removed the power of sin from us. One day he'll remove the presence of sin, but... We only access that by faith, turning from whatever we've lived by, turning from whatever sin we've had and placing all of our faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone. But secondly, today, I'm going to call you to come to the altar to pray, 
or to join with someone else to pray or to sit down with a person of a different color and a different background and pray together and talk together and say, how can we really be the body of Christ, brothers and sisters the way God intended for us to be and for you to lead the way and for you to have the initiative no matter who you are is the best way to start. I'm going to ask that you stand right now. I'm going to ask our prayer team to come to the front. They'll be at the front waiting and ready. And over these next few moments, as soon as I pray, I'm going to invite you to end this service a little differently than you normally do. You have an opportunity, not just to rush off, but to rush to somebody. Maybe you need to take somebody by the hand, just shake their hand and say, somehow I want to make sure that we're bridging the gap in our culture. Somehow I want to make sure that we're walking together in truth. I want you to do that today. Maybe you want to come pray with somebody. Maybe you just want to come affirm somebody. But here's what you don't need to do. You don't need to leave today having heard these things and say, you know, what I do really doesn't matter because what you do does matter. Even the small acts of initiating a conversation means the world to someone today. I want you to bow your head. As I pray to conclude our service, I want you to consider coming to the altar and praying. I want you to consider laying down any attitudes, any mindsets that are racist, that are filled with hatred, that are sinful. Lay them down at the altar. I want to urge you to come and pray with someone. They will help you with that. And I want to urge you to go and talk with somebody so you can build bridges with them. What a great way to end a moment like this. Father, in Jesus' name today, we affirm those truths that you've given us in your word. Thank you that we're all equally valuable in your sight. Thank you that you've created all of us in your image. Thank you, Father, that you've commanded us to love one another unconditionally and that you have first loved us. Thank you for the mercy that you've shown all of us. Father, today my prayer is that we would love others as you've loved us, that we would show mercy as you've shown us, that we would seek justice in every situation where we can speak up, be counted for, and help the situation. And Father, let us as the church be in every expression one that reflects your character, your love, your heart. Father, thank you as we go out these doors today, as we pray, as we leave our attitudes at the altar and walk away full of your spirit. Thank you that you can use us. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.